<clears throat> okay. So, hello. To start off with, would you guys like to say your names and where you are? Sure. My name is Jennifer Jones. I use pronouns she and her, and I'm in Philadelphia in the United States, in Pennsylvania. And I'm Kelly Camp. I use she, her pronouns. And I am just north of Philadelphia in a suburb called Doylestown, Pennsylvania, um, in the Philadelphia, greater Philadelphia uh, metro area, I guess. Okay. Well, it's lovely to meet you both. And the first question for you is, who are you to each other? What is a little bit about the nature of your relationship, but more than like the history, just, you know, what does this other human being mean to you? Kelly's my partner in change. Um, you know, we're on a journey to, to really help GTIP grow, um, the Gestalt Training Institute of Philadelphia. And um, working with her has been a, a blessing in terms of I can't imagine trying to lead the kind of cultural change that we've been trying to make it at GTIP without her. Um, and uh, she brings a lot of drive, a lot of passion, a lot of dedication and commitment to wanting to help create a GTIP that's um, inclusive and equitable. Um, and so I feel like she is somebody who I can put a vision out there and she's like, yes, let's do it. Because <laughs> um, I'm much more of a vision person and she is, you know, she has vision and she is able to do it and make it happen. And so um, I feel like in that way, we make a really good team. Um, and Jennifer, uh, to me, is all of those things. But um, I think it's important to say kind of how I first kind of were, was introduced to Jennifer to get the whole scope of what she means to me. So I was a second year trainee when I knew of Jennifer and had her just as a supervisor in the training. I don't remember ever having you as a supervisor for my own triad, but um, as a adjunct professor in my second year. Um, and just remember the way that she modeled teaching the material by having a conversation with um, David Henrich, one of the founders of the Training Institute. Um, and it really stuck out in my mind, the conversational nature that they had and the back and forth and the exploration of ideas. Um, it was really inspiring. And to just hear two people kind of like chew through the material um, in a really thought provoking way. And so I just remember um, you and I think also because you shared space with my therapist at the time. So like, I, I just always saw your name every week, you know, and, um, and then um, much more recently, as I kind of became involved again at GTIP because I was a trainee there and then, you know, went on with life and then came back as a supervisor, um, as somebody that I saw um, as, as really having that vision for what the potential could be at the Gestalt Training Institute of Philadelphia if um, we could kind of get our act together and be this inclusive space and, and really um, have accountability for kind of where we came and just some of the things that um, like simple, simple seeming things that um, kind of were exclusionary. Um, and I saw Jen as somebody that was really trying to make it different in, in ways that I um, wanted to make it different as well, but didn't maybe know exactly how. So then in um, truly seeing Jen as a partner and as an inspiration and as a mentor and as a brilliant person that I'm learning so much from, I'm honored because I'm teaching my first ever weekend with Jen as the faculty member. And I just feel like, you know, I get, I can feel emotion just of really feeling taken under Jen's wing in so many ways of like how to run a program, how to communicate directly with people in a respectful way, how to say what's happening that other people are afraid to say and just name. And so then it becomes so much less scary. Um, so there's all these ways in which Jen's a teacher, um, but also a friend and just has a great sense of humor and a, 
a love of dogs and uh, a, I think I'm projecting a, an acceptance of my ridiculousness <laughs> um, or at least doesn't seem to like, you know, I sent her a picture of something I had done ridiculous with my dog and she didn't say like, never text me again, you know? <laughs> so, <Aww>. Yeah. Because <laughs> they weren't ridiculous. So I think that's your <laughs> labeling. <laughs> a love of dogs and a tolerance of humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, now the question is to each of you about yourself. Who are you as a human being? Who are you as a person? And that can be your passions or your values or particular qualities about yourself that you'd like to mention. It's a big question, Heather. <laughs> um. <laughs> All the questions are really gestalty. So, <laughs> I mean, in this moment, uh, in this iteration of me at this moment, uh, I um, am starting to realize that. Uh, I am a healer and I am a teacher and, um, and I am um, somebody who loves people and uh, wants to really seize that we are in a time where so much of the trauma of our histories are coming to the fore and, um, and that we're all just needing a lot of healing and a lot of love. And um, so uh, as I am trying to kind of, as my dog enters the room, <laughs> speaking of love, um, uh, that, uh, that I, am, I am a product of uh, many people who have um, had to struggle and toil and uh, that their pain sits in me and that I am constantly working on actively healing myself um, and, um, and in that uh, wanting to support and heal uh, others with me. Um, and uh, there's just so many things, gosh. And I mean, for me, uh, part of that is realizing uh, that um, that our society has to change in order for people really to, to feel healing. And that means actually having a society that isn't run by or dictated by um, money and capital and some people being privileged and some people not, um, but really being a society that cares about people's humanness and really cares about everybody being able to live to their potential um, and, um, and in a sense of connection with one another. Um, so I believe in fighting on lots of fronts and, and one of them is definitely to change our society and the structural mechanisms of our society that keep us separated. And I think Gestalt therapy, uh, theory gives us a way of learning how to heal ourselves, to be able to come to that fight, to heal, to change our structures, um, and that are keeping us separated and keeping us in pain. Um, so that's a bit of where I'm at and who I am. I'm a parent uh, of a teenager who's constantly teaching me um, and who gives me a lot of um, motivation to heal myself because I don't wanna keep passing on the trauma that, uh, that I inherited um, from just our ills of our society to her. So um, yeah. Uh, and I'm a pet owner. I have a dog and a cat that rule my life. And uh, the teenager is vying for a bird now. Um, so we may be a three pet family soon. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm somebody who's constantly a work in progress and makes lots of mistakes and keeps trying again. Wonderful. What about you, Kelly? Who are you? Um, I try, I really tried hard not to think of that answer because I was so curious about Jen. Um, so I, um, I feel like there are so many ways somebody could answer that and I don't want to answer it in ways that I, that aren't really important to me. So I think, um, 
the way that I can answer it is, what do I want to know about myself when I'm maybe if I make it to being older and looking back, like, what do I, what would I like to have done? Um, and I think it's to share with people the healing that other people have given me and like shared with me um, that I, I don't know sometimes I, a therapist, a couple of therapists in my life have asked me like, how, I don't quite know how you made it through that and like got here. I really don't understand it, you know? And so I feel like I don't either, of course, certain things like privilege and have given me um, kind of that uh, starting point that's different. But I feel like for whatever reason, I was connected with different people in this lifetime that um, I feel like kind of took me gently by the shoulders and pivoted me towards like, actually the truth is over here. You know, <laughs> like, I know you think that this was the truth, but that wasn't. Um, and so it's just in this like gentle way of like, what about, what about this, you know? And so I feel like I'm constantly, I'm a truth seeker of, and a sensor of, I can sense when things are not feeling truthful or there's something going on. And I'm, I'm working on the ways in which I get in my own way of like being able to name it and, and like gently include other people and um, try to, master that connection that Jen's talking about both with myself and with other people. So I, I do feel like I thrive on um, connecting and, and helping people connect with themselves and then other people to, to move towards that truth of whatever a situation is, truth of what someone's feeling but not saying, truth of a collective trauma that I can't turn away from. Um, and then also, just this ability to sit with a lot of, I don't want to say pain, but just like truth. I think of like, sometimes the truth is not glitzy and shiny, you know, and it doesn't, I don't feel deterred by that. Um, I feel like I have the ability and an interest to sit with what's real and to really know like who, who like a, a person really is like I love um, like the first time someone curses with me as a friend or you know I'm thinking back of some of the the times in which I felt like oh me and Jen's were getting to know each other deeper because I told her something gross about myself and she laughed or you know just like that realness um, I really enjoy um, and and I'm a silly person too. I'm a very hard worker, but I also think life is pretty absurd and try to see that and kind of not take myself too seriously, hopefully. Um, yeah. Well, I know you guys were presented as part of, you know, a change team, but when I'm listening to you, for some reason, the word transcendent keeps popping up in my head. It's like, yeah. You both talk about coming through things and intergenerationally even coming through things and coming out the other side differently and having an impact through that. So that's interesting. I haven't had that word come up for a lot of people. So that's kind of exciting. And uh, another question for you about a little bit your own individual histories is what comes to mind as a particular event or as a set of circumstances that you would really say has influenced you or put you where you are or shaped you in some significant way? If you have something that's coming to mind right away, Kelly, feel free to jump in. I think the thing, um one of the things that's shaped me is I, I did hospice for 12 years, hospice work, um, both as a, a hospice social worker and then as a bereavement counselor and, um, and I have always worked in like medical social work. And so since basically the age of 23 and in some capacity have been doing social work with sick people. Um, and I think in the city of Philadelphia. So it became, and, and prior to that, so I was already kind of aware of um, just inequity and, and I guess being one of the, like 
valuing truth of just really sitting with like there, this, there is something so prof profoundly problematic with our healthcare system and with just really not understanding. Um, like I remember, you know, living one mile from where I would be going and visiting patients and I have electricity and water and, and, you know, and just like sitting up at night, like there are, there are people I know their names, are, like they feed me when I come to their homes and, um, and like I'm holding their grandson's hand while grandmom's dying. And, and so just like that human level of connection for 12 years, you know, day in and day out of being this person that goes into um, people's lives at like probably one of the worst times in their life and just being like, for the most part, like welcome with open arms and, and people's humanity and feeling a sense of connection when I, I would probably be trying to shove people away, you know? Um, and so I feel like that has profoundly impacted me on many levels on just like, even like having been a person at 19 years old who had like pretty significant road rage to like, by the time I was 24 of having seen enough people like through a diagnosis and a terminal illness and a loss of just really being like, you just don't know, like, you just don't know what someone's going through. I just, you know, and like being so much calmer and forgiving and, um, checking my assumptions, you know, I'm not, and I'm not claiming like that I'm good at it all the time, but it, it, it really had a profound impact on the way I see the world. Um, and, and then existentially, you know, like what I think about death and dying has certainly been influenced the more that you are with people that have actually died as they're dying and families and hearing stories. And like it just provided such a rich, like, rich data points for, I have no conclusion because of it, but, um, but really um, trying to figure it out and, and be with people as they try to figure it out has really influenced me. Yeah, those are very deep, very intimate experiences. Yeah. And not everyone is welcome in those processes. I mean, yeah. I just about sent a couple of social workers flying through the door, you know, when my daughter was dying, but every once in a while, there's a person who gets it and it's okay for you to be there. Right. So it's, it's impressive yeah. to hear that you could do that for 12 years and be welcomed for 12 years. That's, that says a lot about a person for me. So. Yeah, I'm so sorry about your daughter. It just hit me. <laughs> Yeah. that's okay I'm just I'm glad you're one of the ones who people let in <laughs> that, that's like a really big litmus test right there yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm feeling actually very moved by both of you in this moment so. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah I'm aware that um that there are things in my life that I feel like have shaped who I am. Uh, there was something I think passed in me um, to me uh, growing up pretty early to be somebody who cared about what was happening in the world. Um, so I can remember um, hearing stories of my grandparents being involved in the civil rights movement. Um, and uh, very early on, I started feeling like the world was structured in a way, or our society in the United States was structured in a way that hurt people, um, not just from a, a race perspective, but from lots of different perspectives. And um, and my Spanish teacher in high school was from Peru, and she and I very much linked around just some of the political things that were happening at the time around interventions in South America. And she saw me, like she saw the warrior in me, she saw the fighter in me, she saw the person who believed in righteousness and believed in justice and uh, really supported that part of me. And I think that that was pivotal to me, just always looking for ways to figure out how to create um, and fight for what felt like equity and felt like justice. Um, and I think I carried that into college and into my career and things that I thought about. It drew me to gestalt therapy because I was trained as a psychodynamic therapist and it felt too pathologizing and felt not linked to the work that I was doing, working with folks who were living in poverty. And um, 
and gestalt therapy spoke to me in terms of the ways in which it wasn't pathologizing and believed that there was the importance of community and um, really the relational work. Um, and then I think um, making mistakes in my life, you know, doing things that like where I hurt people and I like was human and things I would have judged people for that I thought I would never do made me like realize I am human, you know, because I think that because I was so righteous about justice, like I think I didn't think I was somebody who could really hurt people and I can hurt people. And uh, it made me have compassion and have a sense of uh, what it means to really be human, which is that we are fallible. Um, and and then in the past year, I have really been leaning into learning from indigenous people all over the world about how they have helped people heal and the mechanisms with which they use the ceremonies that they use to have help people heal. And uh, I've been leaning into that more and integrating that more into my own life and feeling like I'm coming back to things that were in me that were um, passed on to me that I've forgotten because of growing up in the societies that I grew up in, the ways in which I was um, really pushed to go to white institutions and want to be white and to act in, uh, get white people's approval. And I really have been on a journey myself to realize I don't need it. And that I actually have so much, um, in me and given to me through ancestral lineage from people and from being a part of the black community being a part of a multiracial community that um and from a lineage of multiracial people um that i'm really owning that in a different way and it's kind of crazy that it took me to 50 to get to that place of really honoring that but it took me on this journey of working so hard to do everything right in the white world, you know, like going through white institutions, getting a PhD, like doing all these things to realize it really wasn't worth it. Like, and I'm sure it's worth it in terms of it's given me knowledge and experiences, but it actually took me really far away from myself. And, um, and so I think I'm on a journey at this moment of really coming more into myself. And that's why I think I named myself as a healer and a teacher, because I think those are things that really feel like me and not what I thought I was supposed to be, which was, I think, what I've been dealing with most of my life. So I didn't have one pivotal event, but more. No, no, that's, that's, fine. that's why, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's why I ask, you know, an event or a set of circumstances, because sometimes it really is the whole combination. So the next one is also kind of a combination question. And you can follow any of the aspects of it that you want. I'm curious how you experience sort of that combination of power and privilege and gender in yourself. Can you say it again? I, I sometimes ask them separately. I mean, how do you experience yourself in your gender or as a woman? But I find that usually gets so closely linked. It's really kind of inseparable from areas of power and privilege. It like it intersects with a whole other series of pieces of the person. Mm -hmm. So just anything you would like to say to your experience of yourself more than even the concepts of power, privilege or gender. It's interesting because what I'm aware of is that um, throughout my life, I have uh, had to really think about like how I identify as a woman. And I think that um, there's a way in which um, at times I really own that construct of, of like what it might mean to be a woman. And there are other times where it doesn't always resonate for me. Um, and so, and I don't know how much of that is from 
growing up buying into so much kind of whiteness of like what womanhood was really defined by someone who didn't look like me. Um, but, um, and how much of it is that there's like a lot of um, non-binariness in me in some ways um, that doesn't really just think of myself as woman. Um, but I'm very, yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think, uh, I think for me, being a woman hasn't been my top identity piece. I think uh, my race, my queerness, my, um, my class, my uh, even religion, I grew up in a Jewish family, like I, and then haven't felt belonging in Jew in a Jewish family, you know, in a Jewish group. Um, so I think those identity pieces so much stand out sometimes more than gender for me. And maybe it's partly because so much of my struggle around race has been with people who share the same gender with me. So a lot of my challenges with white women. Um, and I think I don't have a lot of men in my life in some ways. Like, so I think like they just don't, um, they don't matter that much in, my, in some ways. Like I've worked in, I think because I work in social work and I work in mental health, like I have worked in places that were dominated by women. Like I did not have to deal with the construct of like dealing with gender inequity, you know? And I realized like, I have a lot of privilege in that because, you know, women before me fought to, so that I could be in that place, you know? But the academic challenges that I've had in terms of getting through my PhD program were all based on women. They were not, you know, having to deal with like coming up against men, keeping me out of the institutions. Um, I think I probably felt it more when I was younger, like being in high school at a Jesuit high school that was very boy oriented. It had only been, uh, women had only been uh, invited in for maybe a decade when I came in. And the, the teacher, the many of the priests uh, were very male oriented. Um, and so they really uplifted um, males, but I had enough like female teachers, like my Spanish teacher who really uplifted me. Um, so yeah, gender has not been something that I think I have felt challenged by as much as I have race and knowing like just queerness and um, other things, class pieces. Um, so I feel like I'm not answering your question well, but- Yeah, no, but, no, you are. It's just how do you sort of experience all of those yeah. levels? And it's however you experience them. Like I certainly don't have a right answer. Yeah. I'm just wondering within that, where do you find your own power? Like where, or are you looking for that or experiencing that? I mean, I guess maybe that's the other piece too, is that I, um, I had a mother who was much more, um, needed more of like uh, the movement to really uh, fight for gender equity. Like she wanted in some ways, to have my father be a bit of a savior for her. But then his mother was this powerhouse. I mean, she was such an influence in my life. Um, you know, she was, uh, came out of a black poor family and um, ended up getting her PhD and married somebody who also got his PhD. And, um, and she was the powerhouse in the family. Like she was the force to reckon with and, so I think in that way, um, gender just didn't show up in the same ways for me of feeling like I'd have to fight my way with men to, to be seen or heard or to see my power because she just demonstrated that for me that, um, and, and I just think there was the intersection of race. Like in many ways, black women were allowed in spaces in ways that black men were not. Um, they were seen as less threatening in some ways. Um, and so she was able to move up in ways uh, in the same system uh, that, that my grandfather wasn't able to move up. And part of it was her, her personality, who she was, she was driven, um, she was fierce. 
And part of it was, I think, the mechanisms around them that really made it safer to let her rise up in ways that they just were not going to with my grandfather. Um, so I just think gender plays out differently when it comes to the intersection of race as well. Mm -hmm. um, that my challenges have not necessarily been about feeling equal to men, um, but really, um, and so where I draw my strength from is probably her. I think um, also my great grandmother on my grandfather's side was just, I think, a powerful woman, not in the ways that my grandmother was because she was um, illiterate and, um, but she was spiritual and uh, creative. She used to sing and dance and she loved and people were drawn to her. And I think she was a healer and she had power in that. Um, so I think I draw my power as a person and, you know, as a woman from these two constructs of women, one being this kind of powerhouse in the white world who like pushed forward and was pretty powerful and did everything that society says is, is deemed as success. And another who knew how to love hard and knew how to really be in community and, um, and just with somebody who was remarkable, like people would notice her and want to be drawn to her. And I think that those, both of those energies flow through me and uh, have been a strength for me. Okay, thank you. What about you, Kelly? What comes up in terms of power and privilege and gender as you're in your understanding or experience of yourself? Um, I think uh, never have I felt more powerless than when I did all the things I was supposed to do. <laughs> um, and I used to do stand up comedy and I had a whole bit about, you know, I, by 24, I was married. I had a master's degree. I had a job, a car, a house, a dog, you know, a husband. And um, I was the least myself that I probably ever was in my life. And so I, I kind of deconstructed my, my entire life um, and realized, came out as queer, got divorced, kind of gave up everything, all my money, walked away from all of the security um, and felt, you know, like, the, like probably the baby version of me um, and started nurturing that. And kind of like what Jen was saying of like, have had the pressure out there in the world to become a mother, to go get an advanced degree, to keep getting things. But um, I think because I, I did that kind of went that way before. And then the truth people were like, actually, what about this? Actually, what about this? Um, that I've been able to really connect with myself and to see like, what do I want? And so when I, I was aware of having a reaction like a somatic reaction to the word power of like, Oh God, I don't, I don't want power. But then I was thinking like, no, I, I actually see power as when you're connected to yourself, then you really, there's just so much um, possible in that. And so I really, really, really want to help other people get connected to themselves, not so that they can take advantage of and be powerful over, but, but to like, be empowered and, and really affect change in ways. I think a lot of the problems in our society are caused by people who are completely disassociated and disconnected and then um, kind of and reenacting stuff all over other people. So um, that's my relationship to power. And then part of me doesn't want to talk about um, privilege because I feel like I don't want to give away my little secret, which is that I feel like I'm aware of, I'm constantly um, trying to examine my privilege and aware of it in new ways. But I sometimes refer to myself as like a, like a Jedi of like, I realize I come in this package and that allows me to get into certain places. And then I can sort of be quiet and observe and then like say a statement here and plant a seed there. And, and I don't know if it's more palatable because it's coming from me because I'm a woman or whatever. Um, but I really try to use, use it to my advantage. Um, and I certainly get a lot of advantages from the privilege I hold, but also 
think of like, how can I use this as a tool, not to benefit me, but to like really um, make change. And then in terms of gender, I, I had like, I would say a spiritual moment a year ago when I was in a, a trans training um, institute. There's a trans training institute in Philadelphia and it was a training of the trainer. There's lots of T's in there, but there, there was this whole um, segment on gender non-conforming femme people. And I, I just cried for like 36 hours. I just was like, I feel so seen. I didn't even know that was a thing. There are these people like being interviewed on videos and, and like lots of, you know, um, vulnerability work and like really applying it to ourselves. And I just felt like finally there was a name for how I feel that I have. And I, I don't usually like to say like, these are masculine qualities and these are feminine, but like I do a lot of things that are like all, most of my hobbies are like woodworking and manual labor types of things and like, you know, like chopping things and um, building things and finding out logically how to make something make more sense in my basement and rerouting water pipes and, you know, like, and um, that, that part awesome. <laughs> it really comes alive. And I feel like really excited um, by working with my hands and, you know, um, in many more ways, but like that, that I've always really felt um, was a huge part of my personality that not that I had to disown because I'm also only 40 years old. So I feel like I'm, there's a, a, a time right now where people are allowed to be more gender expansive, but I think I was able to lean into it after having come out um, in my late twenties and then realizing like there are many more ways to kind of come out and like what doesn't apply to me and, and who am I? and I'm still figuring that all out. Okay. So another question for you, and maybe you've touched on this a little bit, is who comes to mind as a significant influence on you in your life? Another person from any aspect of your life? This whole thing about being relational beings and all of that. You know, who immediately came to my mind was actually my daughter. You know, I think we often look backwards, but there's a way in which um, she is my teacher. And, um, you know, she's so much more embodied than I am and um, uh, really loves herself in ways that, that I don't yet. And, um, you know, she can own her multiracial identities um, and she just doesn't carry some of the baggage of like, um, that I think I carry around, around race, around gender. Um, and uh, just allows herself to kind of be who she is. Uh, so she's much more accepting of who she is. So I feel like she inspires me to want to do better with myself, to treat myself better, um, to love myself better. Um, and she's not uh, wedded to the written word. She's not re uh, wedded to like, um, like she burst out in song and she's creative and she doesn't think school is the end all and um, doesn't feel like she has to prove to people that she knows stuff. Um, yeah, she just has this way about her where she doesn't have to prove, feel like she has to prove herself. Um, and yet she's very relational. She's very loving, um, very connected with people, um, with animals. Um, and so, yeah, she inspires me to want to be more embodied myself, more, less caught up in kind of things that I've been taught are what's important um, and, um, and to just get more engaged in terms of like expression and allowing myself to just express different parts of myself. 
me. I'm seeing my daughter as you're talking. You think they might get along. My daughter's yeah. 11, but there's a lot of that in there too. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Kelly? Who came to mind for you? Um, I think in, in similar ways of like who have been my teachers, sometimes the, the most painful relationships in my life <laughs> come to mind of um, there for, you know, and the mistakes I've made of like, but people who've been able to tell me the truth about myself. So that, you know, there, there was somebody in my training program who just like reflected back to me in like this way in which I could take it in, in the third year, you know, my, the final year, uh, but it was hard, you know, but, but of like people that are like willing to hang in there and be like, Hey, you, you do this thing, you know, or this is limiting, you know, and, and I've had um, friends over the years, like really reflect back and, and want to, in a way of like, um, there's, there's so much more, you know, and, um, and certainly teachers and therapists and, um, but also like somebody who comes to mind right now, and I don't mean it in a corny way, but it really is my husband of um, just being so many things that are the opposite of me. And it's like flabbergasting at times, <laughs> but it's also like so humbling um, and somebody that will tell me in like the kindest, gentlest way, how I impact him. And as somebody with my history, it felt like very impossible to ever imagine like a healthy relationship, especially with a man, you know? Um, and so to, to really be learning like what love actually is um, as somebody who like had to teach myself and figure it out, like, um, and like had all the wrong, like, you know, like fantasy things in my head, but of like, um, yeah, that like, and, and hearing, echoing it, like certain things like Jen that you've said about just things over the, the, the training year and things that I glean from, you know, hearing you, um, I don't, not necessarily teach yet, but like, cause I haven't been in the room since 2013 with you teaching, but, uh, but of like ways in which you talk about love where I'm like, yes, that's my experience too. You know, like when you love someone, you tell them, the hard things and uh and then like stay in it like that's just like amazing to me so I feel like I'm finally at a point in my life where I'm like living that out of like oh no like this is hard and we're in it together and like we're not we're not I'm not going anywhere you know my partner isn't going anywhere it's like in the metaphorical sense um because I know we never know but um and just how beautiful that is you know to know there's somebody here that's in it to do hard things. Mm -hmm. yeah. I appreciate that, that you saying- Commitment thing. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I appreciate you saying that Kelly about like hearing the hard stuff because I'd have to say that is also how my daughter is my teacher. Oh <laughs> gosh, yeah. She tells me about myself all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she yeah. unfortunately is often right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you hate it when they're right? <laughs> It's that commitment thing. You probably won't leave each other either, right? You can right. have those hard conversations. <laughs> right. So she, she's told me to go away many times, but she comes back, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I really appreciate this conversation so far. And now it's you can take a breath. So I'm actually going to ask you a little bit about the Gestalti stuff. But okay. it, it's, still, it's still about <laughs> yourselves. I mean, how did you come into Gestalt and what did you find there? Like, what is the thing that has kept you sort of orienting in this way? That actually doesn't make it much lighter, but. Yeah, I was <laughs> gonna say, I thought this was a great. <laughs> you know, it's funny when I um, went into the training program, I was looking for something like I was uh, at that point in my career where I um, knew I needed to dig deeper um, and wanted uh, something that would support me in doing the relational work that I was really trying to do. Um, and so my close friend at the time was like, I'm going to do this thing. And, you know, and so I checked out the website and I was like, yeah, this sounds great. So I jump in and right as I jump in, I find out I'm pregnant with Shulale, my kid. And um, so, you know, they see me through it. But in that time, I, um, when I was about 
34 weeks pregnant, I broke my ankle and had to have surgery at 36 weeks. And, um, you know, the community wrapped around me. My cohort was there for me. The faculty, like, you know, brought me meals. Like it was just, it felt like a community. Um, <clears throat> but because I think I was, you know, in this blur, it feels like being in the training program was a bit of a blur, but I know that things seeped in and what definitely seeped in was that I wasn't finished, right? Like I had more I wanted to do with this community. So I stepped away for a little bit. My kid was young. I started a PhD program. And then as I, you know, got further around into uh, along in my PhD program, I started leaning in more with the Institute again, and then started supervising. And that's then when I started learning all again, you know, and it all became richer. And um, it has been a place of so much pain for me, you know, because it's relational, right? Like, and all of the stuff around race and all of the things that I was like, not really dealing with um, because of my own racial identity development started to kind of come out. And so I have done more work with the group of people at GTIP than I've probably done with relationally with anybody in my life. You know, um, they have probably hurt me more to the core than probably anybody, you know, beyond my family, you know, the family of origin pain that comes with parent, you know, parents. Um, but they've probably gotten the closest and yet uh, there's a commitment on both sides to stick in it. and. Um, and to see it through and we've grown through it. Uh, but I guess what draws me to it is that, that willingness to do the hard work um, and the, will, the tools. I mean, I think Gestalt therapy theory actually gives us the tools if we're willing to really live the theory um, to really do the hard stuff and to lean in with people and to stay curious um, and to own our vulnerability and to really love. And um, I feel like that's what I've kind of found in the theory and found in the people who are trying to do it at GTIP. So, yeah. What about you, Kelly? How did my you get there? My best friend, what did you find? My best friend also <laughs> brought me into the program. I remember uh, we met at our hospice job, we were both hospice social workers. And during lunch, she would on the, you know, some of the days where we actually ate lunch, we, she would tell me about this place called GTIP where, you know, and she would tell me like a piece of work that she had done over the weekend. And she, at one point she was like, you know, being a baby on the floor and, and it just like blew my mind of, of, there was so much curiosity and so much longing of like, I wish I could like do that, but of like, that terrifies me so much. Um, but then overhearing her, you know, do it over the course of two years, I was like, I think I'm going to do that thing because it scares me. And it was at the, this point in my life where I was like, if it doesn't scare me, it's not worth doing. So, um, and then I stayed in it because of basically that it doesn't make us wrong, you know, that, um, that pathologizing really doesn't work for me. Um, I, I found that the more that I can move away from having to pathologize myself and other people, the better I tend to do. So um, that just the, like the idea of a creative adjustment and um, of experimenting and like gathering data were some life-saving things for me to hear and to have as, as alternate narratives and perspectives. Um, and and then just being part of it and learning, my life got better and better and better. So um, I don't remember if there's a second part to the question. <laughs> no, I, I, think it, I, think, I think it was there. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this Can one. One more thing, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, because one of what I kind of also heard you saying made me think about um, the fact that not only has it been the place where I felt the most pain, but it also is a place where I've probably been the most seen you know, that I think that uh, I have been seen for the goodness that I bring into the world. And I don't know that um, there've been many other places that have held me in that, so, in the ways that the community has. Um, so I think that that is pretty awesome. So the next question, I'm kind of like rolling a few in here, because I, 
I, I kind of want you guys to answer this as you really feel like you want to. I, I'd like to know what you've done with Gestalt, but not so much in like an, oh, you know, I did this clinical thing, which was really cool. Um, but more in the, what have you done on a really fundamental level with Gestalt? How are you making it different? How are you changing it? What purpose are you finding for it and in it? Does that make sense? I can start, but I, I don't know if you want to, because I keep starting. So you sure? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like um, I lead with with gestalt in so many ways, like in terms of the dialogic ways of being, the ways of really believing that people are doing the best that they can, and that that has influenced the work that I've done as moving into doing diversity, um, equity, and inclusion work um, in terms of challenging people to start looking at the ways in which um, we're upholding white supremacy and how it's killing all of us. Um, and all of the, the skills that I learned from Gestalt therapy in terms of being dialogic, in terms of thinking phenomenologically, um, in terms of leaning in with curiosity, those things you know, have all benefited me in my ability to support people in trying to look at, at um, at themselves and be curious about themselves and to start be curious start being curious about the ways in which they may be upholding and embodying white supremacy and so um so i feel like i've taken that into the dei work that i've done um and i think i teach you know even when i wasn't teaching gestalt therapy but was teaching in social work programs i was taking it into the way i teach um so to me, um, I feel like Gestalt therapy theory really does give us a way in to, to do some of the work that I think is so important, which is to start looking at our privilege and looking at our ways in which we um, have upheld systems that oppress. Um, and so I've been trying to kind of bring those principles into and theory into that work that I do. Um, and the ways that I feel like I've influenced the ways that we think about Gestalt therapy theory is like back in a couple of years ago, I developed a socially constructed identities in the field because it felt like to me, if we were talking about the field that there was this, the way the social world was already in the field with us, even when we weren't talking about it, even when it wasn't being constructed. And so that one of the ways we could start to understand how microaggressions, how what things that come between us that are not in our awareness. One of the ways that we could understand that was to understand how our social locations are actually in the field with us, even if it's not in our awareness um, and how it plays into projections when we don't speak to it. Um, and I think that there are more and more people writing and speaking about that in Gestalt therapy theory, but it hadn't been for so long. And I know that that is something that I've at least had us having conversations about in GTEP for a while now, which is great. Yeah. What about you, um, Kelly? I think I similarly feel like I live it and lead with it um, in especially friendships and relationships. Um, and even the way I approach things and have been more forgiving of myself and other people just because of having it as a framework. I remember kind of doing initial reading and being at GTIP and thinking like, there's a name for this, you know, like there's a way in which this is so in alignment with the way I want to approach life. And like, the, oh my gosh, there's a whole um, theory about this and set of theories. So, um, and I don't think that I'm far enough along in my life to have necessarily influenced Gestalt. Um, I hope to have maybe someday, um, but right now I feel like I'm a sponge and I'm trying to soak it all in and even understand it still, um, rather than be influencing and changing it. But I do see how it is such a, a tool for um, 
you know, even apply, I, I think the constant application of Gestalt to itself, you know, like of Gestalt to its systems is, is really helpful. Um, and how, how do we move away from applying it and get into like other ways of being like white supremacy, white dominant culture. Um, and then how can we use it to bring ourselves back to, um, but that's not, I didn't come up with that, so. But I would argue that what you're doing at GTIP is influencing the changes in Gestalt. It will have ripple effects because we have no idea what the trainees of GTIP will yes. do with it and where yeah. they take it and what they do with it. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I would say that just the dynamic of being a white female trainer and saying, I don't know, uh, that's significantly different from a lot of other white female trainers that I've met mm -hmm. and worked with. And I, I think it is really important, um, just as you were speaking, both of you, I was just like, oh, it's, it's the embodied phenomenology that gives us a, it's a field sensitive and trauma informed way to, to go to combat, like to push back against the gaslighting that just denies people's experiences on every level, like from the individual to the macro social. And it's like, mm -hmm. It's, it's really sort of that evidence-based approach of going, no, feel this. Yeah. This is in your body. The person is saying this. This is happening right now. Yeah. And it just makes so many things so beautifully undeniable. It's, um, it's really, it's really but powerful with the potential. If, yeah. if it's being applied with that openness that you're talking about, Kelly, and the willingness not to know and to actually let the field be what it is and to recognize what realities we're sitting in. And I do use the plural there. Well, I think what you just said also speaks to why it's so good in like kind of like talking about microaggressions and other things because you know, so often people are like, well, could you tell me exactly what a microaggression is so that I can say when somebody says I've done it, but I haven't. And the reality is that actually that's not how it works. Like it is yeah, no, you, a logical experience. You don't get to name it for somebody else. It's yeah, you've not, never done it. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, I can imagine that you could talk about a lot of the challenges that you guys have faced um, in the Gestalt environment, either clinically, professionally, organizationally. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in how you would name the challenges in this process that you're creating or, or how you're approaching them or seeing them. Well, we experienced it this weekend in terms of we do, we started up, um, the trainees came up with the idea of community meetings and, um, and we had kind of supported it also as a faculty because we wanted to build more community within our institute. And over time we, we created those to be to uphold our desire to start doing some equity work all together and to really look at our, our white supremacy within our institute and to look at the ways in which um, how we might become more of an anti-racist institution in particular right now in this moment and um, and so we've been reading books together as a community um, last year was white fragility by robin d'angelo and this year is um, resma minicum's uh, my grandmother's hands and um, we just had a, a community meeting and uh, resma minicum is a somatics experiencing practitioner who applies looking at um, racial trauma and healing from racial trauma. Yep. And so, yep. And, um, you know, so we're taking people through embodied experiences in this small group. And so many people are struggling with like having to get into their bodies and they're like, and the first years are, you know, who've just been there since September are all like, I'm so sick of this body stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I was doing a pod of just people of color and, you know, on one hand, Gestalt imagines that when we bring people back to their body, that we're bringing them back to themselves and that there will be this way in which it will feel empowering and it will feel good on a certain level. And yet the body is such a source of pain. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so one of the challenges is both like understanding how, um, through the pain will become come the, the joyousness over time because you come to yourself uh, in that moment. But 
but that it's we're moving through pain right now and that's where we are as a community is that we are sitting and moving through the pain and i think that um there probably isn't enough uh written about that or talked about that in some ways that like the, that as we go into ourselves, as we start with a phenomenological experience, what are we feeling? What are we sensing? What are we seeing? That um, it takes such a level of stamina to be able to stay in that discomfort and stay in that pain. And, um, and so we're doing our best to kind of help people develop that self-support and to have enough support in the community. But it, it definitely is a a challenge for all of us white bodies have it so differently because it's like uh i don't want to look at this stuff and and people of color bodies have it you know from like dissociation like just so used to keeping moving and not sitting in it and not paying attention to how they're bracing themselves and not breathing and so it's it's been you know it's been interesting and yet the beauty of it obviously is that we're building community and doing it in this collect sitting in this collective pain um, and trying to really heal all together. Um, so been somewhere between a birthing process and tenatology and hospice. <laughs> like it, it really is that that yeah. sterile void when everything is really like burning it all the way down yeah. and then being in absolutely nothing and then maybe seeing <laughs> what can happen yeah. afterwards. Yeah. And I think like last year was a challenge because I think that because there was starting to be this pain un and discomfort uncovering, you know, people were complaining, you know, trainees were like struggling with it. And the faculty, of course, in their own discomfort were like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. This probably is not a good idea. And then, you know, some of us being able to really stick in it and say, no, this is the process. Where the energy is. Journey. Yep. And so I think that, you know, the challenge is to just keep pushing through. It's, it is, I love that you compared it to labor because it really is kind of like, you know what, we don't actually have a choice. Like the mm -hmm. process has started and the baby's going to come out one way or another and, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and we're going to have to figure it out. And so I think that's it is that once we open this up, we, we and we started this process, we're on it and we're mm -hmm. having to feel our way through it and. Um, and it's it's hard. So. It's hard, and I think it is. I don't want to talk over you, Kelly. I'm aware you haven't answered yet, but uh, just it is the it's the two though. It's the birthing and the dying, and it's a process that if we can take the judgment off of it, it's just really intense, pure embodied experience. Yeah, it's, it's just a thing that go. we're doing. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of letting go and grieving that we're having to do as we're doing it. So I like you comparing it to the, the dying too. Yeah. Yeah. And that on different levels, um, the, the grieving is in opposition, you know, so like, I don't want to speak for you, Jen, but like Jen having to grieve, like being hurt again, you know, and having pain again. And then people like me and white faculty grieving, um, change and it's going to be scary and I'm going to make mistakes, you know? Um, but I, I do see us as, as birthing something. I don't know what's going to come out on the other end of it <laughs> might be a really ugly little baby, but <laughs> we'll love it. <laughs> but, um, but I think I, I like the, the analogy of like the birthing process. I'm a, I happen to also be a death doula. Um, and, um, attended one birth, um, but of like that, um, like that pendulum swing of like leaning people in and then seeing how people so beautifully like get themselves away from pain. And, and I say so beautifully because I don't wanna be pathologizing, but man, is it frustrating. It's frustrating when I move away from pain. It's frustrating when other people move away from pain in like really creative ways and you know, like the same creative ways. Um, but I think this like, there is movement and there is like a, I, I'm believing now, like I don't think we're gonna get stuck. I, I know there's a, like a swaying that's happening and it's painful, but each, each sway like takes us a little bit closer, you know, and then we come back. And, and so kind of just watching and observing if I, I feel also, if you had asked me that question in August, it would have been like, fuck watching and observing, you know, this hurts, you know, but of like, now it's like, okay, the, the, maybe we're, we're not distancing so hard right now. Um, 
And then there will be times when we get really close and we have to distance again. But I, I think what brings me hope and sticking in it is the, the hope that we won't have an ugly baby and that we will have like this thing to show there for are it. no ugly babies. Like, well, <laughs> I'm not a parent. I don't want to be a parent. So I can actually say that. There are no ugly dogs. There are no ugly cats. You know. <laughs> but, but well, I really but like, think, yeah. Sorry, Jen, go ahead. No, no, no. I interrupted you. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I really do think, I really do believe that on the other end of it, um, we will be better able to sit with ourselves, each other, you know, and then that will make a huge impact in some way. I don't know exactly how yet, but that's what makes me wake up every morning. Yeah. I was just thinking, I liked the way you were showing it because it reminded me of the, of the contact sequence, right? Like, mm -hmm. and that everybody does have to at times move away. And that that actually is a part of the process, um, especially if you're willing to keep going back in. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so it is, it is pretty awesome. And then it is such an experiment. I mean, that's what we keep telling our trainees is that we're just figuring this out as we go and, you know, um, and really trusting the process and trusting us and, um, and that, that we'll see where it goes and that we're grateful to them to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other part of that is, you know, it's death and birth and orgasm. They're all about intensity. And if you take the value judgments off, just like lean into it. You know, you can't stop it once it started, really. Just just go for it. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. I guess you can. But, but hey. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm definitely coming back. I'm aware of your time, but I'm coming back to that little word that kept popping up at the beginning for me there, which was just about transcendence with you two. And that really feels like that's where you're going. I'm not even gonna ask in detail about what's coming up next for you um, and where you think Gestalt should go because I know that you're very actively taking it there. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your writings and your videos and the way that you are speaking out about the changes that you're bringing in Gestalt. And, you know, I very rarely um, praise an American model, but I really like what is coming out of this falling apart of some of the really deep structures in the US, um, because it makes it easier for a lot of other parts of the world to go, oh, okay, it's not quite like that here, but we really need to pay attention to this as well. That was what, mm -hmm. sorry, I was just going to say it was exciting, uh, the uh, program that Alice and I did with, and that Annie was there, um, was just hearing from people, at one around the United States, but also um, around the world, and knowing that there's, there's work that we could all be doing and learning together around this. Yeah. And I mean, everybody's individual anti-racist processes, our own decolonizing, and then taking that all into the Gestalt field. I think that there's a lot of future there. And I just really appreciate all of the work that you're doing and this conversation in particular. So is there a final question either of you would like to ask the other one or anything else you'd like to say? Well, I, I wanna one, just express gratitude to you, Kelly. I think I try to regularly, but I, I, I really feel it. Um, so I'm hoping that in this moment that we've been quiet with, or not quiet, but jiving with, you know, really jamming with each other talking that you hear me, the gratitude I have for you. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I feel like we get to share with each other like lots of different parts of ourselves. So I'm not sure if I, what my curiosity is. Maybe sometimes there is this curiosity of like what keeps you going. <laughs> Like, where do you get your batteries from? Because they're amazing. <laughs> well, I could give you the honest answer, which I will, which is fine, but it's, it's ADHD. You know, like I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have the kind of ADHD where I'm like hyperactive and um, well-treated and have had a lot of trauma and relational and somatic therapy so I can like know myself and when it's happening um and it's a good match like when I'm being productive it it shows that I'm in alignment with like what I want to be doing and that like it gives me more energy so um like what motivates me is is thinking of people 
that have never had access to GTIP coming and having the training and having and being able to experience like not being cruel to themselves or not, um, you know, falling victim to their internalized inferiority, you know, and, and really being able to heal that and then go out into the world, a healed, powerful person that like that. And I mean, that alone is like, if, if I can do anything to make that happen, that's worth it. Um, and so, but other than that, I think it's a brain thing. It's a brain and trauma response <laughs> that I happen to have like been very fortunate to have healing, you know, with mm -hmm. ongoing healing. So, well, I'm grateful that you bring it to <laughs> your gifts to GTIP. Thank you. And I'm very grateful to you too. And you do tell me often and I, I feel it. And I really love being able to have, just be witness to Jen in conversation and like in awe of, of listening to Jen talk. And I'm very excited to get to witness you teaching and yeah, I just like soaking it all up and feel very fortunate. Yeah, no, my intimacy addiction is completely satisfied. <laughs> just just being with the depth of the two of you right now. Did you have any final thoughts or a question for Jen, Kelly? Um, I'm sure I have a question for, I don't know. It's probably something gross, which I feel like I don't want to put her on the spot because it's just really like gross things. So I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, perfect. If that's okay with you, I really, really appreciated this conversation with you both. And we'll leave it here then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Heather. This is really meaningful.